everything's working. Okay, we are live on Facebook and uh, we are recording now. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, do some introductions. I'm John Mercer, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I'm pleased to be uh, having a video conversation with Dean Jackson, uh, owner of, uh, of Hoob Designs. And I'm gonna do an introduction for you in just a second, Dean. We also have uh, Ted Gerard uh, co-hosting this with me. And uh, the purpose of these video conversations is to, um, it's really built around first my class, Biomechanics of Endurance Performance, uh, showing how we apply biomechanics to real world situations. But then it's also for um, our sports science initiative at UNLV where we are working on sports science uh, research and innovation uh, initiative where we're trying to do a stronger connection between academics and uh, industry partners. And uh, I've, I've been working with Hoob Designs and Neve Jackson specifically, uh, well, since about 2014, I think it is. So it's been a while. Uh, and it's also for our Las Vegas Triathlon Club. I say that's in, in the real world, uh, the most important part for, you know, working with athletes and, and, uh, and, and, and hitting some of the questions that they have about uh, how to go faster or further or complete uh, a, a triathlon. So uh, it's exciting to have, have them on, in on this call as well. So um, this is, uh, you know, a, a chance to talk with Dean. And when, when I started thinking of these video conversations, Dean, you were really one of the first ones I wanted to get on because you and I, you know, connected back, I think it was 2013 or 14. And I was doing some research on uh, swimming and wetsuits. And I reached out to you because your tagline for Hoop Design uh, was really uh, founded or focused on research. Yeah. And they said, oh, how cool to be able to reach out to uh, a company that, that values research while also uh, developing product. And since then, uh, we've been able to have lots of different conversations and uh, work on different projects. And you've been very supportive of that. Oh, and I have to do say, I do have a bit of a conflict of interest because I race in hoob gear. <laughs> so wetsuit, uh, kits, uh, compression socks, and uh, I, you know, I love the gear that you put out. So as an athlete, it's, uh, it's very uh, good. And, and as a researcher, it's nice to be able to work with you. So, so welcome to this video conversation. And uh, you. I, know, uh, I actually wanna start, you know, that part of this is our sports research and innovation uh, concept, you know, talking about um, getting companies started. If you don't mind, just sort of talk about how you started Hoob Design. I mean, you started it literally in your garage. Uh, but how did you come across the idea of starting a company focused on uh, developing websites for triathletes? Um, well, it kind of goes back to my history. I'm, I'm probably one of the very few in the industry of sports industry of what swim, bike and run. So when I was 19, I set a running shop up in Derby called the Derby Runner, which still exists today, but I'm nothing to do with it. Um, I went to work for well, helping distribute Orca, and then I moved to Quintana Roo and Quintana Roo also got me involved with their bike project. So that was, so that's swim and bike. Um, and before that, in the late nineties, I was head of marketing for ASICS, um, did a lot of work with biomechanics, uh, mechanicists, get the world right. Um, and that, that was really, that was my first foray into research because ASICS as a brand are so uh, you know, wrapped in research. And I went to their um, Japanese test center with a British sprinter called Christian Malcolm. And I saw there what they were doing to make their products better. Hmm. And that's kind of lived with me and stuck with me ever since. Uh, the day I came back, I lost my job with ASICS, which was hmm. unfortunate. The, uh, the financial director decided to clear off with millions of dollars and left us all in limbo. Um, and it, it, it was a necessity thing, really. It was 2011. I was working for Blue 70 um, Wetsuits, and I was running their global sales and marketing, a, a great team. Um, I spent one week every month in Seattle. And uh, you know when you get to that point where you know your time's up in a business, and I was in Hawaii, and it was um, 2010, I was sat on a pool, it was a slow twitch party. And Blue 70, we originally came up with the kind of the concept um, for a party. 
out there. And, and I just, and something just came over me and said, your time's coming up. You've got to move on. Uh, the CEO and I, um, he told me, you know, my time was up there and, and it was okay. And so July, 2011, I just wrote a business plan for a company that didn't have lots of bullshit. If I may swear, forgive me. Um, I was fed up of working for wetsuit brands that would give their elite athletes their wetsuit and these athletes who they pay and sponsor and say, isn't this the best wetsuit you've ever used? And I thought, wow, that's the best wetsuit I've ever used. Then can you quantify the benefit? Oh, I feel 8% faster, 8% faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about flexibility? Oh, you know, they never heard the word modulus, but it was, oh, the flexibility feels 20, oh, 20% 20 faster. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have Yamamoto neoprene making claims of um, uh, our Aerodome neoprene is 30% more buoyant. Well, it wasn't <laughs> more buoyant. So it, it got to the point of necessity in 2011, I thought I've got to do this on my own. I'm, I'm 41 uh, years old. And if I don't do it now, I never will. And my daughter wants to go to university and I've got a mortgage and yeah, help. Uh, and so I wrote the business plan for a company that had three core values and that was research, science, and reality. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you think of a milking stool, a milking stool only has three legs because it will stand on uneven ground, but it will stand up on anything. And so for me, this brand would stand on research, science, and reality. And the research would be, I'd look at a sport, I'd look at a problem, and try and understand what the issue was and how we could put it right. And then I would turn to science, which um, I know Donald Trump will argue with science and proof, but I would never do that. And, and then the reality is, if it means you have to have gold-plated goggles, it's not going to be commercially viable. But if it means they can be rubber goggles and it answers, solves a problem, and then it will stand up. And, and, and so Hoob was built around research, science, and reality. And with Professor Hoob Toussaint, who is a long-standing name in the world of hydrodynamics, I met Professor Hoob um, at the railway station in Schiphol in the Netherlands. We'd already worked on a suit for an open water swimmer uh, called Martin van der Weyden. Mm. And we created this suit for Martin. He won the open water swim in Beijing. So Hoob and I knew each other. When I met Hoob with this concept of a brand that didn't, that didn't lie, um, he said, Dean, I'll work with you. And, I, and I'd already trademarked his name, so he kind of had to come on board, really. He said, I'll work with you as long as you listen to what I tell you. Because I've told so many swim brands how to make their products faster and they've ignored me. And actually I was there with the guy, I'm not very clever, saying, give me all the knowledge you have, Hoob, and I'm gonna put it into a faster product. So that's a really long answer to a, a, a question for you there, John. No, that's great. And, and no, I can envision uh, Hoob, uh, Dr. Desan, uh saying something like that. So, so that's, pretty, that's pretty neat. But yeah. now, okay, so let's go to your innovation because you have, you've already been, a, you've always been an innovator with what you design even. And I, you know, the first thing that story sticks out with the who wetsuits is your zipper. Sure. I mean, can you just talk about innovating wetsuit from that perspective and even, you know, the zipper idea and, 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 and uh, oh, uh, maybe to, to, to Ted, you were good at this last time. Maybe I'll pull up a video of the zipper. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Okay. Um, because your zipper is, is very unique. So how do you go about, you know, figuring out where to innovate or how to innovate a product like that. Well, that's probably the only one where I'm going to put my hands up to borrowing an, or taking an idea. And the breakaway zipper belongs to Quintana Roo. Mm -hmm. and, and when I went there, um, their wetsuits were made in San Diego. And they, the breakaway zipper came from sailing. And that YKK zipper is used to access a bag that has to stay dry very quickly. Mm -hmm. So that on the end of the bag, you'd pull and then it would open. So to be fair, it was Herbert Crable, who we all probably know from Slow Twitch, the mad German. Um, and it, it was part of his research and innovation. I'm not sure if Dan Enfield put it in or not, mm -hmm. but it was that collective uh, with the breakaway. But then the breakaway zipper disappeared. And when I was at Blue 70, they had the reverse zipper, which apart from a bit of bulk at the neck, I could never understand why you'd want to take a, a zip to travel this distance to get it off when with one pull you could release it mm -hmm. but even with innovation we ran a risk because people 
don't quite understand the breakaway zipper. There's an education piece. If you take it too far up, it can break open. So I wanted to put it in, but while I was at Quintana Roo, there's a, a, a triathlete, you may know Bruce Gennari. You've heard of Bruce. He's a, he's mm. a fish in a very good age grouper. Okay. Um, and I sat down and looked at the Quintana Roo wetsuit with the breakaway zipper and just said, is that it? Because you look at a bike and bikes are made of carbon, but it's how you lay up the carbon. It's what shape your tubes are. It's are you going for aero benefit? Are you going for lightweight? And so many, many different things. And then there's the engineering considerations. And I looked at this wetsuit that was in front of me with very simple paneling and they fit great. I was like, well, where's, where's the added benefit? Where's the, we can make you go faster. Um, and I've always been a, a, a believer that you need to have a benefit. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to wait while you play this? God, my hair's dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is in the beginning. Look at the logo on the t-shirt. Wow. We learned a few lessons there. <laughs> Is that playing for you or just silent? Yep, yep, no, it's playing. Yep, and there's the there you go. Your pull up on it. And now I do have to say, as a user, whenever I'm racing on my own uh, I, and I need to do my zipper up, I always need to go find someone else with a hoob wetsuit so <laughs> I can, uh, you know, just make sure that they don't over pull it up yeah. and, uh, and break it away. So, and Absolutely. I guess we should even start it. A lot of people in the States want to say hub. But really, you say hoob all the time. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah. We, we it's, uh, it's, it's Germanic. And in the Netherlands, it's hoop. Yep. So it's almost like H-U-P in, in the Netherlands. Ah, okay. And it means bright mind. Ah. Uh, and that was pure by chance. <laughs> there was no study in that one. Um, so if I go back to the QR piece, I sat, I sat there um, with, with Bruce Gennari. And we, we were just trying to imagine when you swam fastest and when you felt fastest. And we decided it was when you had a, a pull, I have to be careful, pull, pull buoy. I say pull boy between your legs, which can mean many wrong things, but bear with me, pull boys. So we created in the, uh, the super full for Quintana Roo in 2005, four or five, mm. um, the virtual pull boy, which was a mass of thicker rubber on the inside of the thighs that um, focused the buoyancy in the center. They still had out a nice natural roll, but just gave an extra bit of buoyancy. This was before we invented and created Sinky Legs through my work with Swim Smooth. But straight away, Bruce said, I can just feel a little bit of extra lift in my legs. And that little bit of extra lift is making me go faster. It's streamlining my body. And Bruce is a great swimmer anyway. So if he felt a different, I knew it would make a massive difference to, to an age group or such an unaccomplished athlete. And it was then I started looking at wetsuits like running shoes. Having done six and a half years at ASICS on their footwear development committee, I loved shoes, but I could see how you had neutral, underpronation, which was a minority, and overpronation. You know, and then we were all about controlling the foot, and I believe it's all it's kind of a slightly different way now, and you know, letting the kinetic chain move naturally. Um, and I just wanted to put a bit of that into wetsuits because not everybody swims the same, not everybody's body makeup is the same. So we need to address those different needs. And at the minute we address it in, in two ways at Hoob. We are going to take that even further with exciting developments that are further down the line. Well, that's great. Yeah, no, that, that I, I really like that approach. And, um, you know, speaking of the, the science part, uh, now that Ted showed that video, let me show the video of some of the work that, that you've done uh, using the MAD system. Uh, let me share my screen. You've been lucky there, John. You've been at the at the front end of that one. You've seen the mad system more than me. Oh, yeah, it, I love it. I I would I really enjoyed going down and spending time doing this with uh, with the team. So here's the. But I think what what's important about this is your sort of dedication to the research part of uh, development yeah and that you know some of the people that we'll see here are some other researchers that you work with and steve faulkner
And that's obviously hoop to sant right there. Well, obvious to us, but. And so in this device, this, this is your MAD system uh, that you, you know, helped uh, Hoob to uh, sort of refine and, and get to a point where you use it for testing your, your uh, different swim skins in this case or wetsuits. Yeah. Those are all force platforms. That was a real challenge for me to get that going because it was so expensive. Turn that down. I'm sorry, what was that? It's how expensive it was to get going, but it was, a, it was a project I nearly dropped after two years. And Professor Hoob convinced me not to drop the project and we had to persevere. Well, and you're really the leading company in doing this type of work because I don't know, I actually I don't know of any other uh, what two companies that are doing uh, this type of measurement. No, no, none of them are anywhere near it. I would be amazed if any wetsuit company's ever been on the original MAD system in the Netherlands with only one force plate. I know swim brands don't have anything like this. The biggest swim brands in the world don't have anything like this. We, are, we have by far the best equipment of any water-based brand in the world with, with the MAD system. And that's thanks to Professor Hoob and his tenacity to make sure we spent the money getting that one built. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's, that's allowed you even more opportunity to, to innovate. But now you've always been, your company's always been connected to the community and you do yeah. a lot of work. And, you know, I speak, you know, the innovation with, you know, para athletes and, and even kids. Can you talk a little bit about how you got involved with the uh, para athletes and, and how you approach maybe those unique designs? Yeah. Um, so we were approached in Derby by a, a para triathlete called Phil Hogg. And, Phil approached us to help him with his dream of making the Olympics in paratriathlon. This was before it was even in the program, but he was kind of hoping it would get there. Um, Phil was an able-bodied athlete who was doing time trials, and he had his head down, and he didn't realize that a car had stopped with a flat tire. And Phil went from the back of the car, through the car, and out the front end, and was paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, but that didn't start, and what I love, it didn't stop Phil's dedication or commitment to being the best athlete he could be. So Phil contacted me and asked if we could help him with a wetsuit, and he'd need some, some unique needs. Now, I, I was looking beyond the fact that he had uh, muscle wastage in his legs and he needed something tailored and unique. I was looking at to what buoyancy he's going to need, any body control putting in. But to be fair to the whole para community, they just wanted wetsuits that would fit them. I was in Japan and at half six in the morning, I'm in the pool with their top para athlete who's only got half a leg on her right side and she's still swimming with half a leg flapping around in the pool. So I cut the leg off and we, we got some bulldog clips and we chalked it all up and figured out what she was going to need. And she was so grateful. And it, it kind of occurred to me with Phil Hogg when he first came to me that there's lots of brands painting the big aspirational picture of swim like us, swim like him, isn't Hawaii great. And Hawaii is great, but there's other sides to this wonderful sport we're in. And I personally felt that if you don't give to your sport, how on earth can you expect to take away from that sport? And I was fortunate at this stage, I'd launched a business with, with you know, pennies. We got traction and I just felt it was my time to do something back and help an athlete achieve their dreams, irrelevant of able-bodied, you know, limb situations. It was, it, I always felt it was my duty to make sure they had the same experience as an able-bodied athlete. Oh, that's great. And it's neat, you know, to have that connection and uh, having that value as a company. Um, I'm going to go back to what you said, because this actually is, is part of the para uh, athlete as well, in terms of, you know, trying to approach what to design sort of like running shoes where you have over pronators and what have you. And the, how many different swim styles do you see? Uh, and and uh, how do you see that influencing um, the size availability or models available <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in wetsuits? Well, I don't know how many of you are aware of swim smooth. Yeah. Uh, and swim types. And uh, what are they, is it, is it seven types? I think they have on, on swim smooth. I'm an Arnie, that's for sure. Um, 
in the ideal world, I would create a wetsuit for every different type of swimmer mm -hmm. and in every size. Unfortunately, I probably don't have a warehouse big enough for that much stock right now. Right. And, and your retailers certainly don't, and your mail order especially certainly don't. And when I was looking at the problem of, of wetsuits, I was I just left Blue 70. The Blue 70 do a wonderful wetsuit in the Helix, and it's a great, great wetsuit. And it's great if you're one of the 15% of triathletes or, that are from a swimming background. 85% of triathletes are from a non-swim background and swim like that. But the market was only catering, and has only catered in, in brands still, apart from ourselves, for the 15% that have a good body position in the water. Now, I was constantly getting asked by not the best swimmers when I was at Blue 70 for the top suit because it's the one that Alistair Brownlee uses. And I'd have to try and explain that he swims a bit different from them and maybe the best suit for them was this new concept I created that was called balanced buoyancy, where I had a little bit more buoyancy in the thighs and hips. It was only one mil more and not as differential as what I have at Hoop. But interestingly, the athletes that it was suitable for did enjoy the suit we created, but they still wanted the top suit because they still wanted to look like their heroes. So when I started Who, I created the top suit in two different buoyancies. And I guess it's like creating, you know, your, your Nike uh, 4% for a pronator or for a neutral. I was creating that race day wonderful piece of equipment for somebody whose swim style was over here, but also someone whose swim style was over here. That was helping me satisfy that desire and aspiration to look like your heroes. Whilst at the same time, knowing I wasn't selling that a triathlete, the completely wrong suit for them. So I felt brilliant that I was giving them something to make them faster and brilliant that I was satisfying their need to look like a superhero. Now, what we did was we just looked at something as simple as the buoyancy and Leg sinkers, I've got heavy, dense legs. Probably not got the best kick. We struggle without a kick, which we know will raise the leg. So we decided to just stack the lower part of the body with five mil neoprene. And most of those leg sinkers, if you're on Arnie, you're going to be pretty tight in the upper body. You may be going to overreach. You're going to be divorcing the water every time you go and swim. So by working with Swim Smooth and Paul Newsom and Adam Young, we kind of thought, well, hang on. If somebody's stiff and tight up here and you've got a big set of lungs, this isn't going to sink. So let's just put flexibility in some buoyancy. In the lower legs, thighs and hips, let's stack it with as much buoyancy as we can get within the five mil regulations. And that's how three, five buoyancy came about. Three mil top, five mil bottom. And we need to create an identity for this. So we came up with sinky legs. And sinky legs is now used the world over in the, in the world of wet. So it's not addressed as well as it should be by them, but they still use it. And that was, that was our unique point of difference, John, when we came out. But Paul Newsom from Swim Smooth was swimming the channel and I was down, uh, I where, where was it? I forget where he was, he went from, um, down, down Kentway. And he was still in a, uh, like a, a trailer park, you would call it, but a holiday park. And you have to wait till the time is right to cross and you get a call from your little boat that's going to take you over and you have to be ready. So you basically camp out at Folkestone. And we were very lucky. We had um, Shelley Taylor Smith with us, who's one of the greatest open water swimmers ever. And she, she was, Dino, if you're going to design a wetsuit, can you design one for women so my butt doesn't stick up in the air? Mm. And of course, women have less dense muscles. They don't, they have almost the opposite to the men, 85% like that, whereas you only got 15% like that in the women. And all wetsuits were stacking five mil and five mil and making most women too buoyant. They couldn't engage the kick and it just felt too alien. And I heard stories of a lot of women swimming slower in wetsuits, which just didn't make sense at all. So we had, we looked, we completely reversed the model for the women as to what we had for the men. And then we're out there in the market saying, uh, here's only two of what could be seven, 10, 12, how many different versions could we have? Well, this is just a, a, a different approach. It's been proved by science. We did some testing at the Peter van der Hoogenband Center with Professor Hoob. We saw the merits and the benefits of the buoyancy. It was on some fairly, you know, um, military style winches and being towed through the water where if you just oh, moved really? your head slightly, you get a massive variance in your results. 
but he gave us some benchmark. Yeah, so I'd like to see a lot, a much wider range of suits, John. But right now we've got 100% more than any other brand have because they they stick with one model, yeah. one Boeing CMO model. So you, I know, I think you've been exploring 3D scanning uh, with like uh, Alistar. Um, do you see that uh, technology of where someone can 3D scan their body? I know you and I have talked about that in the past too, but do you see that entering the market at some point? Oh, yeah. I mean, the first time I witnessed it was when I came to see you and I got a 3D scan of a, a stood up blubbery whale that was me. <laughs> uh, thank you for that bird on my retina forever. Um, I'd like that to be here as soon as possible because if I just look from a raw business point of view, my biggest returns percentage are for sizing yep. because we all think we have the figure of when we're 18 and we still think there's some six pack down there and, and we get, we get it so wrong. Yep. The day we can scan somebody and understand where there might be densities of muscle or fat and, and, and that, that, that's an ultimate customization of buoyancy. But please, 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 you know, you clever bods, just give me that tool I can attach to my phone or my iPad mm -hmm. or somebody can stand in front of their computer and spin around mm -hmm. and we can get their sizing because the best experience is from a wetsuit that fits you well and obviously delivers the buoyancy that's needed. So I can't wait for that to appear. Mm. We need it. We really, yeah. really, really need it. Well, I, I think we're close and I know I've got some students listening and, and I always uh, push doing the 3D scan because I think the more we use it, the better we can figure out how to use it and uh, and improve the technology. We've just used it with Alistair. Um, so Alistair's had an off-the-shelf swim skin. He did Kona. Alistair swims wonderfully well anyway, but he swims faster in a swim skin. But he's got such a unique body shape. Mm -hmm. He's long and lean, and we've had to create a whole new wetsuit size around him and his brother and, and most pros, which is the small tour, which is extra small in volume, but um, medium in height. And so we took uh, Alistair to the uh, Silverstone Research Sports Hub and we 3D scanned him. We made a 3D printed mannequin of Alistair. And we found we could take three inches out of, of, of his waist and lower back from his swim skin. Now we've got him in a small one, but we could still take some more and tailor that fit. And the tighter we can make his core, the smaller we can make his frontal area, the thinner we can make the sausage, shall we say, the faster he's going to be in the water. Oh. So that's an instant advantage we have. And now we have a 3D mannequin. I don't have to ask Alice to keep trying to suit on and tell me what it feels like. Tell me, but we can fit it as comfortable as we can get away with and as tight as we can get away with. And he will swim faster. Absolutely no problem. But the 3D scanning would make that also awesome easier. That, that's awesome. So you're, now you're bringing in the fit part. When you go and watch a race or when you're at a race, how, what percentage of of the athletes do you look at in in the prior to the swim starting and say, oh, that's a bad fit, oh, that's that's too big or that's too small or too long or what have you? Where 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 are people with fitting, or is it that they're just putting it on wrong? It's a lot of it is putting it on wrong. I mean, there's this the, the triathlon wetsuit industry has a few of its gurus and gods, but even the gurus and gods of this industry have probably never done any research or testing of, of, the, of the drag and done some nice research on patterns but really do they understand what's going on and you know we, we prescribed that small wheels were, were faster and accelerated quicker and were more aerodynamic and I'm not sure that, that what the real truths are around that it might have been there was only small wheels around when Dan Anfield was making his QR bike who knows but I think there's lots of things we hang on to. And we hang on to the tighter the fit of the wetsuit, the better it is. Mm. And so you'll see pros on the start, and it looks like what they're wearing their little sister's wetsuit. And it's right up here, and it's right up their legs. And I understand they cut the legs to get out of it, but in Ironman, it's not quite as relevant as an ITU. And then you get towards the back, where people have just bought anything or borrowed somebody's. It's got big, saggy areas, and it, it looks like a weight loss you know, elephant that's got lots of saggy bits going on. And then you, you get the age, it's the age groupers to me that get it better, that have spent a bit of time to get it right and can be quite demanding because they have every right to be and they're data driven and they're not sponsored. So they're going to buy what is right and what fits great. And I don't blame them at all. So that's where I see the best fitting. 
And I think one of the common mistakes is go as small and small as you can. But really, as, as long as it fits close to the skin, and you've got to have, you've got to have plenty of freedom in the upper body, mm. and that's why we have the arms neutral. You know, you can have suits where arms are up or arms are down, but really, you've got to look at the tension that's going through the materials. And when you put a really tight wetsuit on, it may feel really tight and all snug here, but you need to understand you you probably tension that fabric and put it through a thirty percent elongation and stretch pre actually trying to swim in it. So you, you, you're taking it past the point of comfort. And that's why we test a lot of our materials for the modulus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, going back to the question, I, I, the, the biggest horror is when people say, I borrowed a wetsuit mm -hmm. and they get in the water and there's too much water comes in and then panic on sets. And, and you know, that, that, that can lead to death as we see in many mass participation events. Oh. Oh, yeah, no, and, and, and I know you've got some shops that, uh, you know, promote doing, uh, you know, trying the wetsuit on. I think of Uncle's shop, shop with a, he's got a, an endless pool in his shop to, so people can try these on and, uh, and get a sense of what fits. I'm sorry, Ted? Yeah, so back to what uh, Dean was just saying about, you know, the, the, the water coming in and, the, and that feeling. There's also, I mean, you, you already nailed it too. It's like the too tight also gives that feeling of constriction and yeah. you know, there's you know, reports of uh, lots of reports, obviously, of of the stress um, um, and the anxiety of of the too tight. So I think that we need to, you know, obviously think of both both sides of that, and, and I think it's critical. One of the things we did on our neck was, when you're buying a wetsuit, the biggest barrier to you saying yes was it's too tight here because mm -hmm. you can't breathe. Yeah. Now, it's the reality is when you're stood up, gravity is pushing you down and out against anything that's holding you. So if you've got something that's fighting you, once you're in the water and you're horizontal, it's very different because it's a, it's a completely alien environment that we're in. So we decided to leave our necks open hem. So there's no folding, there's no double layers, there's no stitching, and it's just nice and comfortable. And if it fits right, there's no water going to come in. It is a bit of a problem if you're trying a wetsuit on when you do have an endless pool, John, because the water's being forced over you and will let some in. But there's nothing wrong with having a bit of water it, get in anyway. And if the suit fits well, you shouldn't have too many hollows in the lower back and et cetera. And a wetsuit is designed to get wet anyway. But yeah, you're dead right. There's that balance between nothing must come in and, and I, I can't quite move. And then you get the panic because it's not your swimming pool. You're not 15 yards away from, from a handrail. You, can't, you, you can see the bottom in your pool. You can't see it when you're open water and all of that. And then if you can't move, yeah, you can totally see how it sets in. So, Oh, that's great. So let's transition from what you've done in the wetsuit world to what you're doing in the cycling world. I mean, this has been uh, really a couple years uh, that you've gone in the cycling world. How? how I, obviously, I, I see the parallel there, but what moved you from working just exclusively with wetsuits to uh, going into the cycling? Um, yeah, it, none of it was planned, John. <laughs> 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 it was, I'm not the smart guy, right? But the people around me are incredibly smart. And John, you're, you're part of our fellowship of speed of the smart people that we can, we can throw a problem in and all kinds of wonderful stuff comes out. Uh, one of those smart guys is Dan Biggum, who's an aerodynamicist and he's done Formula One. And he just happens to, in his lunch hour, six weeks ago, got the fourth fastest, um, time for an hour he went 52.5 k's mm -hmm. in his lunch break you know what i mean just unbelievable this guy now dan approached me if he could just have some casual wear from us because he was helping me with the aerodynamics of the animoid tri suit and i said what do you want it for dan so i've got a, a cycling team there's four of us we're not bad at the pursuit and we need some hoodies and things so i went oh, okay dan i said you know cycling's an, in an interest for me a few years down the line let's keep talking but you know we're developing triathlon and then this team just got better and better and it wasn't through money because they didn't have any it was through using their brain and understanding and as dan calls it power in and power out and if he's putting 300 watts in he wants to know that he's not wasting energy onto the power out so he's minimalizing that all along the way so he suddenly had this team that were turning up at world cups and podium in and actually qualifying for the World Cups on the track cycling in the team pursuit. And I just thought, isn't this exciting? 
the ability to support a team that are just smart and doing it differently. They even changed the running order of the pursuit. You know, the, the first man, um, he went back to second rather than the, the back or fourth or whatever the running order is. It's called the Medi method. Mm. And then he had a little rest and then he kicked and went again. And he went and did six. So he got him out the gate, then had a bit of recovery. Then he did, he'd do a K on his own. And then he'd fall off the back exhausted. But they just changed the way it all worked. And they played to the strengths of the riders rather than trying to get the riders to fit a, a method that already existed. And so Dan asked us if we'd get involved more. And I, I just didn't want to miss an opportunity to get into cycling with the most wonderful story and team ever. And when you think about cycling, you've got road racing where, where, where there's drafting and team tactics and radios and everything else. You've got time trialing where there's, there's gears and wind conditions and surface conditions and roads and everything else. Or you've got the track, which is pure, pure, pure speed. All the elements are the same for everybody. Even the humidity is the same for everybody. Um, and that's the, to me, is the very pinnacle uh, of the sport. And if we could get something right and go in at the pinnacle, for us to filter down, it's a lot easier doing it that way than trying to get up to the pinnacle. So we work with Dan, we work with the team. Um, we, we found that British Cycling had their specialist cycling suits made 10 miles away from our office. An amazing woman there has got a little team that put them together. And we just asked Dan to, to bring in some experts. And then we started working with Total Sim and Vortec. And they were the team behind the British Cycling Success of Clothing. They were no longer working with British Cycling. So I asked if we could commercialize some of their IP. So we, we struck up an agreement. And then we put the cycling team in these suits that were so small and tight that you really couldn't walk straight in them. But when you were on a bike and you were at 60 Ks an hour, they were just like missiles. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, the team are racing in London at the World Cup and they won it. <laughs> they beat national governing bodies. Yeah. And this is just four guys sharing a house. Yeah. It's Honestly, it's unbelievable. They go hairs on the back of my neck now talking about it. Yeah. And we said, this has to be, this is a gift. And I have to take this gift and do something with it. And if I don't do anything with it, I'll look back and go, what if? And it, it, it may work in the long run. It may not work in the long run. But right now, we can't keep up with cycle clothing sales because everyone's training indoors or going out on their own while they're isolating cycling. But that was how it came about. And that's taken us on, on, on a, an even further journey of understanding cycling and aerodynamics and when we and we, we're bringing that john back to tri suits mm -hmm. so we created an aerodynamic suit in triathlon for 22 23 miles an hour but we need to now create one for 18 to 20 miles an hour and we need to create one for 24 to 27 miles an hour and they're different trips and they're different locations and they're different fabrics and we've learned more about where it where a trip is most active in the range and where fabrics are. So we're testing fabrics on a mini wind tunnel on different diameter cylinders. So you know it works on the leg or on the arm or on the torso. And now we're building a suit with what fabric is applicable for what diameter of cylinder and, what, and also what speed of rider and size of rider. And that, that's for us to come out with next. We got into cycling with the team. The team were then told they couldn't race by the UCI because the UCI didn't like Mavericks coming in. And so they said, well, screw this. We're going to go and break the world record at the individual pursuit, the team pursuit. And we're going to have a go at the hour record. So uh, the USA's Ashton Lamy is going to have a go at the hour record with um, Dan Bigham and John Archibald. And they're going to go for uh, individual and team pursuits as well. And their hope is that they break the world records. And when the commentators are there at the Olympic Games, they can say, well, actually, the world record for this event is held by the Who What Bike team or by Dan Bigham. Or, and that would just be fantastic because UCI have been so anti them. It's, it's, it's shocking, really. Yeah, no, that, that UCI change in rule was a little odd, but, but it, it's really neat to hear uh, how, how this has developed and, uh, and, and the parallels between what you've already done in wetsuits with uh, just transferring that over, over to cycling. It, it is. You, you need to come at it from an outsider looking in yeah. and just saying, what's the performance benefit in that product? And how in-depth and knowledgeable is the science behind it? Mm -hmm. And the truth is, isn't that in-depth and isn't that knowledgeable? 
and sure the very pinnacle of some of the suits on the track it is but henry schumann bronze at the olympic games gold at the commonwealth games in triathlon in january that was the first time he'd been in a wind tunnel first time ever hmm. so i'm gobsmacked so i'm looking at every sport now and thinking how deep does the research really go how deep is the technology and there's some sports like motor racing and formula that are absolutely buried in it but i have to think that actually you don't need to peel many layers back to think we could go further and we could go even deeper and understand more and cycling you know there's a lot of italian myths around some of the clothing and some of the equipment you know and Cervello exploded an awful lot of that and i've just finished reading that book about the story of Cervello. i don't know if any of you read it but it's a fantastic read and yeah you know, I, I for, for me cycling scared the living daylights out of me going into that world of all these secret aerodynamics but once i got in there it, it's not as super knowledgeable as you think it is it's people like dan big and that really really are pushing the boundaries and vortex and total sim they're at a whole new level than, than everyone else so for me it's an easy easier route, route to access than like shall we say competitive swimming mm. well and and i think what's neat is you're you're building up this body of knowledge yourself and now you can apply it to the other areas and i know you put a lot of value in in you know athletes and and researchers that come in uh but i think you're I see you bringing and applying what you're learning at each stage into uh, new areas. And so it's sort of, it's really fun to watch and, you know, even developing socks now for, uh, for cycling. And I really like your idea of developing clothing for different speeds of people because yeah. I've already, that's always been a limitation. I mean, uh, some of the aerodynamic, you know, savings that we see in these charts, it's when you're cycling, you know, speeds that a lot of us can't sustain. And so why, why do I need, you know, a, a, a suit like I need something, you know, like you just put out the two piece suit, uh, which is great, you know, because people do stop and need to, you know, use a restroom or something like yeah. that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So having some functionality is, is important. But I'm curious, you put a lot of value and, you know, uh, insight from athletes and you get a lot of athletes give you feedback. You also do the research. Where can you think of an example of where maybe you have um, have changed the way you thought about a product based upon uh, either an athlete or or a researcher or maybe the vice versa where uh, you brought something to the table that's that's so unique that um, that maybe it was challenged the way other people were thinking. Um, well, an, an obvious one is the is the way we went with the three five buoyancy. That yeah. I thought I was stupid coming up with something that surely other people had done and tried and, and yeah. thought of and it hadn't worked. So that was a, that was a massive one. Um, I, I think what I've seen with the cycling team has helped influence so much, so much on working with Dan Bigham and just learning, just learning about air flows. And I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, well versed in it, but just looking at, actually how a product is used at the time it's being used and not before and not after and not hung up in a shop but how it is actually used and i guess one of the first products we did was our tri suit was the core tri suit in 2012 we launched it and we looked at we looked at two things we looked at nutrition while you're competing mm -hmm. and we looked at bike position now so 2012 Bike fit was more popular, not as popular as it is now. And most people were riding a more open hip on a tri bike, but the chamois in the suits had not moved. And you still had three quarters of the chamois at your back, at your back end, looking like a, a diaper, a nappy, mm -hmm. when actually you were almost sitting on the sea. So we moved all our chamois 30% further forward. And that suited some of the split nose saddles and just a more open hip. Uh, bike position and no one else had done that and it just made our suit so much more comfortable to actually ride in mm -hmm. it might have looked a bit weird when you stood in the shop and the chamois up near your belly button but it just made it practical when you were using it mm -hmm. and then we also looked at nutrition i don't know about you but i'm not the most flexible if i've got to go right behind my back and try and get something out we thought well surely if it was here 
when you're running, the least movement is here and you should be strong. It's not flapping around your back in your tri suit. So let's put it here. Mm -hmm. So we put um, our, our gel packets here and we looked at how many gels and nutrition you really need, especially now on courses, you're given a gel, you'll be given drinks. So it's probably a gel for each transition, if that. So we put little pockets in here. It didn't it, it interfere with it, with um, your arm swing and it was easy accessible. And even when you're in an aero position, you just did that. You're not causing risk to others or yourself by trying to reach too far back. So th th there were small wins, John, but that was just as thinking about the product. No, no that's great. And, 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 and I love that functionality. In fact, uh, I know an athlete who uh, accidentally um, wore their tri shorts on backwards uh, for a race and they said oh that was so comfortable so even you know what, what you see you know you're talking about moving the chamois I mean that was they discovered that by accident but I yeah. think you you bring that practicality to uh, to product design so um, so that, I, I can I, I love this discussion and talk with you about all different ideas but I want to be respectful of your time but um i want to i already know the answer to this question but uh we've done the fellowship of speed which i really enjoyed being part of where you brought together you know cyclists olympic athletes uh academic uh faculty and just you know we all just sort of brainstormed for a day and that was super exciting so in my class i always have students do a group project and uh you know i always start off and say you know i i I hate group projects because, you know, you get a group of people and one person sort of slacks off. So one person says, Hey, I'm going to really, you know, take it in one direction. And it's always hard to get those, that group to talk, but yet in reality, in the real world, our group project, everything's a group project. And, you know, I really see you and you're talking about all these different people that you collaborated from swim smooth to uh, Dan and, and uh, Hoob, obviously, but maybe, maybe just a general statement. How do you approach, designing, um, you know, I, I'm looking at your poster behind you, keep calm, build an empire. How do you build the hoop empire based upon a group project? Um, yeah, a, a really good question, John, because my kids bought me that poster oh. because I was working from home at my kitchen table, build, trying to build an empire that would feed them and clothe them. Oh. Yeah, so that, that's them, because I, I'd go, look, leave me alone, I'm building an empire. So that, that's, that's what they got me that for. Um, it's an interesting one because there's times where I have an idea and others won't buy into it. And that's because I don't think they're smart enough to buy into the excitement of trying it and testing it and just seeing what the hell might happen. And they're probably smart enough is the wrong word. They're not risk averse enough. I see everyone in, in academia and the level you're at, you're so inquisitive and wanting to, wanting to fail because you're going to find something that works along the way that it's the right thing to do and I've, I've had people around me in the past you know when i was at blue 70 and i wanted to do the, the balance buoyancy to get the legs up and they didn't no you can't do that because the industry's never done that and we can't change things so there's there are some projects that i'll just run off that because no one's listening to me mm -hmm. and they, then you have to have confidence and belief in yourself and just go you know what this just feels right you know why has no one put pockets on the side of the body I don't know, but it feels right. So I'm just going to crack on with it anyway. And it was only when I started working with P Professor Hoob and then with Dan and yourself that you, you have to just step back and go, there's some incredibly smart people around here. And they're not aloof. They're not stuck up themselves. They're not pretentious. They're just inquisitive. And it's wonderful to have that with the, with the Fellowship of Speed to be able to say, well, you were there in the meeting, weren't we? We said, how do you keep an athlete cool during the Olympics? And what was it? Well, Rob came out with something completely nuts, didn't he? And it was just, <laughs> it was just wonderful to hear it because by going this far, you might end up here. But if you're only going to go this far, you might end up there. And so by stretching the imagination, it took us to that, that crazy point. Even just when we were tasked with building an aeroplane and see how far it would fly, mm -hmm. you know, bringing the engineers from Boeing because we've got better ideas than you are. I mean, it's incredible. Like. <laughs> I, 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 I feel very humble when we're doing it, uh, but also reveling the excitement and imagination and creativity 
uh, of you lot and the engineers amongst you of how to solve a problem and the way you go through it. And yeah, I've tried to read books on that kind of process and they're thick, ruddy books. And I haven't got, I haven't got the patience for it, but just by spending a day with you lot in a room, oh yeah, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So it's not down to me, it's down to everyone else who's in the fellowship. Well, yeah, well, thanks. Well, it is, it's neat because one, one you, you get the right people together and then there's the freedom to be able to, you know, uh, share ideas and then they just sort of grow off each other. And, and that's why I've, I've enjoyed uh, the Fellowship of Speed uh, meetings that we've had. They're, they're, uh, they're, it's a good group of people and, uh, and it's just fun uh, to sort of put ideas out there. And, and it's okay if your idea is crazy because you never know when it, when it actually might catch uh, steam. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, that was Rob's. It was a, it was a BOA system that undid, and undid your tricep, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. I, I, I'm still thinking of how, how, how that idea <laughs> can actually uh, come together because it's such a, that, it's such a unique... That was it, tight, tightening the core during the swim. Yeah. But you let it out for the bike. Yeah. Uh, so, um, how's your training for London Marathon? <laughs> um, it's, I'm so pleased it's been postponed. No. <laughs> it hasn't gone well. I've, I've had a recurring um, fascia issue on my, on my right calf. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it's because I used to be a competitive runner. Yeah. And because I'm cycling, you know, your cardiovascular is in pretty good shape. Yeah. And you, you remember how to run again. And suddenly you're on the treadmill going, I'm going to go for a seven minute mile. And you're going, yeah, this is all right. I'm going to finish off the last quarter. At a six minute mile yeah. and then your, your muscles just go we're expanding and we can't get out we can't get out and I, I, I keep having this recurring problem so at the minute I'm doing hour runs at 11 minute mile in which feels immensely pedestrian for me and I've not got any fan on I'm sweating it out but the calf's behaving so I'm thinking if I can get a couple of months of just hour hour and a half at 11 minute miles I have a stronger base and hopefully the, the muscle will tighten up and I've got until October now so I've got plenty of time John but I'm, I'm training for track cycling now yeah. as a pursuitor. So oh. that's really testing the cardiovascular. That's really opening my lungs up, mate. Really opening my lungs. Well, I know Ted and I need to come and try to, to bike on the track at some point. But, you know, I, I do have to also give you a shout out because when you're, you're training for the London Marathon, but you're also doing that as a fundraiser. And yes. so what are you doing fundraising? Because I know you've done this a lot with, uh, with raising for different charities. What are you, what are you doing this time? Um, so this time, uh, raising funds for a community trust in the city of Derby, um, that are, are reaching out to some tough areas and taking sport, especially football, because it's national sport, in, into these areas of deprivation and, and just trying to engage with the kids and bring them together, bring them a focus and give them something else uh, to do rather than perhaps do the things that they, we would rather not be doing on the streets. So raising some money for them. And then we also have some other initiatives throughout the year where we're going to be raising money for uh, prostate cancer. And also um, there's, there's an organization in Derby. Um, so it's kind of two quite polarizing ones. You, you have an organization, Annabelle's Angels, and it's just for young children with cancer that's, that's helping them in, in their, you know, their later stages of, of their life, even though they're in early years. And then the other side that we're raising some money for is, is something really, really unique. And it's called the Derbyshire Institute of Sport. Now, you have talent pathways and the good will get on the pathway and they're on the train to the Olympics or the commies or the Pan Pacifics or whatever it may be. Those that have either fell off or, you know, they're pumping away on the train and trying to chase it, trying to chase it and can't quite get on. So this, this charity group in Derby um, they, they've got a collective of 40 athletes that just need a little bit to get on the train. Mm -hmm. So they're funding them with, with s &C and physiotherapy, with some equipment and all hoop training wear. And we're just trying to help those athletes get on the train. And mm. you can look that and go that, you know, you, when, when, you're, when you've got Annabelle's Angels that is, 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 is devastating to families, but then at the same time, we're trying to do something for dreams and ambitions mm -hmm. of sport. And sport is so powerful. Um, we, we'll sit to do wonderful things um, and activities. So it's, there's, there's four charities we're involved with. It was going to be a full year because I'm 50 this year. 
and I had so many activities going on, but they've all been postponed. Now, I'm not sure that I should smile or grimace at that one. Oh, man. Well, I, I, I love how you connect to the community uh, in so many different ways and, and uh, love watching your Facebook and uh, the social media channels that you have you. and how, how engaged you are. Because you've got a successful company, but like you said, you push it back out to the community, which is, is so important. So, Yeah, we right now, businesses are hurting, and yeah. I'm sure they're hurting in the States, and individuals are hurting. And never mind, if, you, if you've got the virus, then that's a complete different level of, of surviving. Never mind a business, that, that's almost irrelevant when you, when you have the virus. But we, in the UK, our NHS, we're very lucky. I've lived in America, and... I wish someone could transplant a national health service in there for you because it, it, it's something we take for granted, although we're not right now. We're very fortunate to have it. And so we've, we've lost over half of our business as a company and it is hurting us. But our goal is to keep paying our staff. And we decided what can we do that can benefit the, the national health service. So we've created a cycling jersey and a running T-shirt. Our factory in China has turned out a thousand of them in a week, which is unheard of. We're trying to fly them in and we put out there that the profit from every single one will go to the NHS. And we sold over a thousand cycling jerseys. Mm. So and it takes me back to um, you keep giving until it hurts. Oh. And, it, you know, you don't do it because it will come back. No. But you just do it because we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. And there's some brands that are just sat on their hands. Mm -hmm. And we, we won't do that. We won't do that. We'll, we'll fight for every, every sale, but at the same time, we're going to fight just to do the right thing because we don't want people to forget that we're here, you know, do good and bad. We're in it together. We're just taking an advert out in the triathlon magazine. Um, and it just proclaims, you know, we're in this together. Let's work together. Let's see if I'm it. Oh, look, full supplement in, in 220, all about the fellowship of speed and what you've been up to. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so this is our advert, I hope you can see it, in the Triathlon magazine. Yeah. And it just says, we're just checking in. We know you've lost out on training, and we'll see you all soon. So I think for what we achieve as a brand from technology and science and fellowship of speeds and making athletes faster, really, we're, we're, we're part of an amazing sports community, yeah. and we're quite a fortunate sports community, I think. And for us, the biggest thing is to be, make sure we, we re retain part of that through, through good times and bad. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, and, and I'll tell you, that's why I've been glad to connect with you. Is, and I always enjoy uh, chatting with you. Or is, is you're, you're trying to do things the right way, if you will. And yeah. it's not just a product. It's more about an approach. And that's where it's been fun to, uh, fun to be part of that and, and watch it develop as well. So. Dean, thanks for your time. This has been uh, great to connect with you and just sort of chat with you about things, uh, you know, wide range of, of, uh, of topics. So uh, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. No, my pleasure. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not sat here um, waxing lyrical about the joys of science and coming up with something amazing that no one's discovered. But, you know, I've got a simple man's approach to this. And, it, you know, it, it's the smart people like yourself, John. So thank you and, and thanks for hearing hearing a bit of my story. Appreciate no, it. It, it, it's inspiring. And so to, to see what you've built, what you've built. So it is inspiring. So great for uh, all of us to hear and the students to hear as well. Okay, I am going to end the Facebook live stream. So thanks everyone who, uh, who was on there. So I'm going to stop that. And I'm going to stop the